Dr. Salim Dreira from Norway. Uh, Dr. Salim Dreira has two BS degrees in nuclear engineering and chemical engineering, an MS in mechanical engineering, and a PhD in nuclear science and engineering. He currently serves as the VP of R&D for Thor Energy, where, he, where his work is primarily focused on the development and testing of thorium-based light water reactor fuels. Specifically, his current research focuses on the commercial manufacturability of thorium-based oxide uh, fuels. So the title of his talk is The Evolutionary Adoption of Thorium Beginning with its Application in Niche Light Water Reactor Fuels. So I would like to call Dr. Salim Dreira to the desk. Yeah. All right, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm here today to give you an overview and uh, sort of a status update of the recent uh, Thor Energy program. Um, it's going to be fairly high level and uh, include a little bit of technical detail, but if you have any other questions uh, that we're not able to cover here, please don't hesitate to approach me or my uh, colleague, Carla Vitanza. So first of all, I'd like to give thanks to our international consortium. This is a, a group of entities that helps support us through our funding and also through, uh, through some technical knowledge. Um, it includes Fortum, which is a Finnish utility, Westinghouse, uh, our most recent uh, uh, entrance, which is Kairi, um, the Institute for Energy Technology, uh, the National Nuclear Laboratory, ITU in Germany and the uh, Norwegian Research Council. So this uh, international consortium was established in 2012 and it, basically its uh, objective is to license thorium-based LWR fuels. Um, it's a, it's a five-year project uh, that started in 2012 and will conclude in 2017. Um, we have two programs under that structure. One is, is uh, a fuel fabrication program and the other is a, a fuel radiation program project. Um, we have a budget of about 96 million NOC um, and the largest contributor is the Norwegian Research Council from that. So Thor Energy is a small company. We were established by a larger company, our mother company named Scottech, which stands for Scandinavian Advanced Technology. And this is a, this is a company that is, has developed many companies and is interested in the concept of taking research and commercializing it. Um, and Thor Energy happens to be one of the uh, companies that it spun off to do that. We're uh, advanced thorium-based uh, oxide fuel manufacturer for uh, today's and tomorrow's light water reactors. Uh, we focus mostly on near to medium term applications and benefits to nuclear utilities. Uh, we're established in 2005, so about 10 years ago. Uh, we formed the International Consortium that took place in 2011, as I mentioned earlier, at conclusion of 2011. Um, and then our largest milestone today would have to be our uh, loading of our phase one fuel into the Halden <coughs> test reactor, which occurred in 2013. Uh, so I think it's very clear that the world needs a mixture of energy solutions in order to progress into the future, and like most of us here, we believe that thorium is part of the nuclear um, for the future. Um, but we believe that nuclear, at least as it is dominated right now by UO2, has to remain that way, and that thorium can be a near-term application, but only in niche applications and light water reactors. Uh, we believe currently that thorium addresses two um, large policy drivers, that being the post-Fukushima era, um, where people are more interested in accident-tolerant fuels, and more specifically, fuels that are oxidation resistance, or provide a certain degree of oxidation resistance for uh, severe accident scenarios. Um, the other issue is plutonium management. Um, we also believe that, that thorium addresses some critical uranium challenges, such as uh, increased safety in operation. This is primarily due to its, uh, to its uh, material properties, such as higher thermal conductivities, 
and also due to uh, more robust oxidation or more robust, uh, I should say, thorium dioxide is a more robust uh, oxide material compared to uranium dioxide, and due to this, uh, it provides a more stable waste form. Um, it also allows us to go to higher burn-ups uh, potentially in the future. Uh, Thor Energy now focuses on two primary fuels. These are niche applications, as I mentioned before. One we call the thorium additive fuel. Uh, this is approximately, uh, right now about 5 to 10 percent is what we're testing in uh, thorium dioxide in uranium. Um, we have developed concepts that go up to 40 percent. This is to mitigate the amount of poisoning that you need to use in your reactor, such as gadolinium. And the benefits include, um, you know, it's essentially being able to have better fuel economies, um, simply because when you absorb uh, a neutron in gadolinium, you don't get it back, whereas with thorium, you could potentially get it back um, by the creation of more fissile material. Um, we also get improved safety margins, and this is, since you have a more distributed thorium than gadolinium, you get uh, better power flattening inside your reactors, um, and that in turn leads to larger departure from nuclear boiling margins. Uh, our other our other concept is a is a uh, ATF version of MOX fuel, accident tolerant fuel MOX, um, and the primary reason for this is is because thorium dioxide doesn't have a higher oxidation state, the plus six state that uranium dioxide has. So in a severe accident scenario, you don't have to worry about hydrogen liberation. Um, we also get uh, great or increased uh, plutonium incineration and also very little plutonium creation and very little transuranic material creation as well. Uh, so we believe that the world moving into this thorium nirvana or, the, or possibly the the world where we would eventually see molten salt reactors needs to begin with uh, evolution. Um, and basically, we see the evolution beginning with light water reactors uh, with, with a minor application such as the thorium additive option in light water reactors, um, potentially small amount at first, 5 to 10 percent, um, and then progressing into other concepts such as the thorium MOX option. Um, and possibly other high burn-up options as well, um, maybe in conjunction with uh, oxidation-resistant claddings such as uh, the fecal uh, stainless steel or silicon, car silicon carbide claddings. Um, and eventually, we believe that this experience will help open, uh, the, you know, open the gate towards a future closed cycle, thorium U233 cycle. Uh, like I mentioned before, we have two programs uh, within Thor Energy. One is the fuel fabrication program, which I'm going to talk about now, and the other is the fuel radiation program, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, basically, our fuel fabrication has been split up into two phases, um, and that's because we have a, a two-phase irradiation right now. We are irradiation, irradiating phase one material. Um, and that material is, is come from either us or ITU, and I'll explain more about that in a little bit. But our fuel fabrication is focuses on the four steps for defining a powder, powder metallurgical procedures for creating these fuels. Um, and those four steps are powder preparation, powder milling, pellet press, pressing, and pellet sintering. Um, and a lot of the thorium dioxide, or Primarily, all the thorium dioxide that's created today uh, is created through an oxalate <coughs> precipitation method in which it's calcined at very high temperatures and for very long periods. And because of this, you get a very uh, clunky structure, something that's very unideal for creating high-density light water reactor fuels. So this is primary, primarily our largest obstacle in creating a sort of a, nu a nuclear-grade uh, thorium and a nuclear, um, and, and a pellet then of, the, of high uh, density. We began uh, with surrogate fuel testing, and this, in 2009 we had a cooperation with Los Alamos National Laboratory where we created thorium cerium pellets. Uh, cerium is a uh, surrogate for plutonium. Um, that, as you can see up there in the left picture, uh, we were able to create 
uh, pretty good pellets, but we know we needed to take another step, so we have uh, another phase where we've begun uh, field, or field manufacture testing with the Institute for Energy Technology in Norway. And we concluded that about a year ago. Um, we'll show you a little bit about those. And we're also currently now manufacturing thorium plutonium pellets. And part of the, part of the steps in going towards a, a robust uh, fuel, or a fuel that is considered ideal for irradiation, involves several steps. Uh, this simply illustrates one of those single steps. Um, towards the end of the, the fuel manufacturing campaign for thorium cerium fuels, we noticed that we had about a 94% density of that of theoretical density, and we needed to improve on this slightly. Uh, we noticed that we had a, a sort of an interconnected porous structure in the center of the pellet, and this is typical when you have sintering parameters that are, are somewhat ideal. And this, this happened basically because of, uh, you know, we take the, we take the route, um, the thorium, dioxide manufacturing route, and we try to adjust it as little as possible uh, for, thor or for thorium fuels. And in, in doing so, we noticed that we had to change some of the sintering parameters and to sinter at different heat rates. Um, but when we applied these changes, we were able to get a 95.5% theoretical density pellet, um, which is, is doing quite good, I would say. We've also been manufacturing thor thorium uranium fuels. Um, we have three variants, uh, that containing 7% thorium, 25% thorium, and 40% thorium. The picture on the left there is our 7% material, whereas the picture on the right is the 40%. And we, we assumed that the 40% was going to be the most, um, at least the product that was going to be harder to attain, which it ended up being, but we were able to ultimately fabricate pellets with, 90, with about an average of 95% uh, density of theoretical density. Uh, here's a picture actually of three of our, co or me and two of my colleagues in the uranium lab um, holding up some of the first thorium dioxide additive pellets that we created. This picture is about three years old now. Um, so the phase one plutonium thorium pellets, they actually came from the Institute of Transuranic Elements in Germany uh, they were originally part of the Amico project and were transferred to us so that we could begin phase one irradiations of plutonium thorium bearing fuels. Um, these are some pictures of the pellets that arrived right here. Uh, the pellets, as you can see, they're lined up in columns about 40 centimeters in length before they're put into fuel pins. And here's a what some of the fuel pins look like in it. We are, we're testing our fuel in Halden, and we have the luxury of using, utilizing a, an IFA or an instrumented fuel assembly. And I'll explain this a little bit more in detail later in this presentation, but you can see from these pictures that the fuel is, uh, is uh, drilled through the center. You can, can't really see it on the screen up there, but we're able to insert thermal couples and measure the fuel temperature online just um, phase two of manufacturing. These pellets are, have been manufactured over the course of the last two years, and they're to be inserted into our final irradiation, which will begin later this year. Uh, these pellets right here are surrogate pellets for the final plutonium thorium fuel manufacturing. What you see right here are green pellets. And as I mentioned before, we were able to achieve a 95 5 95.5% post center, and uh, that was also before po before sintering. They had about a 67% uh, theoretical density as a green pellet. In order to begin working with plutonium materials, we had to put together an alpha fuel manufacturing lab. Um, this took a couple of years to complete, but it was commissioned in August of 2014. Um, we're using it to create our phase two material, which is actually going on right now. Um, and we have plans to utilize this fuel facility in the future as well for creating other variants. Uh, here's a 
panoramic image of the entire laboratory. Um, as you can see, there's overlap. This section right here, you can't see off to the side, but it includes nine alpha boxes. Um, I'll explain to you what all these are. First of all, this is, the first box here is a powder uh, accepting box, and, and uh, the plutonium or the thorium or whatever um, gets unpackaged in here. And then we have a, a powder uh, milling box, a powder or pellet pressing box, a quality control box, and a sintering box right here. After the pellets have been created, they are extracted and e taken to one of these three boxes where we can either drill holes in them or grind them to the appropriate size. And then they are transferred over here to this box where uh, they're inserted into claddings and welded shut. Uh, here's a picture of some of the team here and myself that works in the laboratory. Uh, here's a lineup of some thorium cerium pellets that we manufactured. Uh, it's sent uh, right here inside. This is the quality control box that I mentioned earlier. So the, the fuel irradiation campaign, um, we began irradiations in 2013. This was a picture of us actually on the day that the, the instrumented fuel assembly got inserted into the Halden reactor. This was after it came out of the, um, the high temperature test loop and before it went into the reactor. And we ha our radiations are essentially in two phases. Um, one began in 2013 and the other will begin later this year. They include different fuels, as I mentioned. This first rig contains a variant of, of thorium uranium, 7% uh, uh, thorium bearing uranium fuels, that is, and also the Omico pellets um, that are a uh, plutonium thorium. Uh, rig two will contain three variants of thorium uranium fuels and also uh, our own created plutonium thorium fuel as well. Um, because of the use of an instrumented fuel assembly, we're able to collect a lot of data um, while the, the radiation is occurring, such as fuel temperature or cooling temp coolant temperatures. And also through the use of intricate LVDT technology, we're able to get fission gas release information, uh, information on fuel stack elongation, which helps us determine the uh, swelling parameters a uh, cladding elongation, which helps us to determine the uh, pellet to clad interaction time. And also, um, let's see, I think I mentioned most of the things, yeah. So again, if you have any more questions about this, please ask later. Um, here's a picture of the instrumented fuel assembly. It's about four meters in length, um, but the field section is only about 40 centimeters in the middle. And for our second rig, this will actually change. We, in this first rig, we have uh, six rods that are be, going to be installed in, in this area. For our second rig, we'll actually have what's called a double cluster rig, which enables us to irradiate 12 field pins. Uh, yeah, here is a picture of the loading as the, the fuel assembly there goes in, down through the top plate and the, the instrument cable, which is connected to the instrumented fuel assembly. And you can see it follow it down to the position in the core where the, where the uh, um, f where the IFA is actually installed. Um, and since then, we've been getting um, data on our, um, on, on our fuels. And an example of this data that I've mentioned before is the fuel center line as a function of burn up. And this helps us to essentially determine properties such as the thermal conductivity as a function of burn up, uh, something that is very critical for licensing in the future. Uh, so the project timeline, as I mentioned, we began in 2013 with the first irradiation. When we pull, uh, when we put the second rig in, a few fuel pins are actually going to get pulled out this year, and we'll have our first series of uh, PIE, um, and this is going to be a combination of, of destructive and non-destructive PIE. Um, this rig will continue to be irradiated in 2017. Second rig will hopefully accumulate as well, approximately five years of irradiation, although the, the uh, consortium right now is only established to go to 2017, but we, we see it likely that it will go probably at least two years or so beyond that in order to accumulate the required burn-up that we would need for licensing. Um, and then we hope to insert some lead test pins and possibly a lead test assembly into a commercial reactor. Um, 
first starting in about two years, two to five years from now. And uh, to wrap up this talk, I would like to mention that Thor Energy aims at uh, extending contracts with interested companies. And we ask you if you're either interested in becoming part of the International Consortium or just interested in such issues as fuel fabrication or irradiation testing of variant uh, thorium variants, please, uh, please speak to one of us. Um, and this, of course, there's our international consortium is, is quite broad right now, but there's two large elephants in the, in the uh, thorium, or I should say in the nuclear industry that aren't represented, that being India and China. Uh, we hope to eventually one day have more collaboration with them and to uh, share in the uh, future of whatever this may bring. And uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you and open up for questions. Thank you. So uh, the floor is open for questions. Yes, one, two, two in the middle. Uh, what are the parameters for radiation uh, that you're going to achieve in this, uh, in this uh, campaign? You're, you're asking about the parameters for radiation? Radiation, how many megawatt days? Oh, yeah. Um, so our, our goal is to achieve a, a burn-up of approximately 55 gigawatt days per metric ton. 55,000. Yeah. So um, it's basically the, the commercial standard these days. That's what we've set our goal at. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. This is, uh, there's no U-233 in this, he in here yet? No, that's correct, no U-233. But plutonium thorium, huh? Yeah. We're, we're, oxide. We're oxide? Uh, say that again? It is oxide material? Plut Offsite material? Plutonium oxide thorium? Oh, yeah, oxide material, oxide. of course, yeah. Okay, uh, just, uh, please. Yeah, behind you. I, I saw the pellets. Is that with the plutonium thorium pellets which you see with the people standing up behind? Uh, which picture are you referring to? It's some picture was there, number of pellets are there, and some people are st st standing behind. Yeah, right here? The, yeah. The, those, are, those particular pellets are the thorium cerium pellets, those, the those, uh, surrogate those pellets. Those are not uh, plutonium based. No, those aren't yeah, plutonium, plutonium variant plutonium pellets. The way you no. showed me that. Yeah, actually, our thorium plutonium manufacturing is going on right now. Um, so that's essentially why I don't have any other than the other than the uh, Omico originated pellets. I don't have any uh, pictures. Uh, what of plutonium the time scale pellets. you think would be from going to uh, uh, thorium two thirty three uh, type of reactors? From today. Um, time. Well, yeah, can you say that again? I'm sorry. What will be the time scale to reach the thorium 233 uh, type of reactors? Um, well, we're not primarily focused on any U233 application, so I'm not sure exactly what I would say for the time scale on that would be. We're focusing on uh, once through open fuel cycle options. And so we're not analyzing uh, thorium-233 or thorium and uranium-233 applications. Thank you. Okay, one question in the middle. Thanks for this very interesting presentation. And may I be allowed two questions? Yes. So my first question is uh, very quick. You uh, indicated that you were planning to have a lead test assembly or lead test fuel pin in a light water reactor by 2017. Have, have you identified uh, a reactor yet? No, we haven't identified a reactor yet, although we have been um, in open discussions about that with some members of our consortium. And my second question is uh, related to your very last point. Um, indicating that you're looking for more collaboration, especially with India and China. So That's my question right. is, uh, are you also considering uh, looking at pellets for um, pressurized heavy water reactors, uh, which may uh, improve the, uh, the willingness to collaborate by those countries? Yeah, I think um, 
so in the past, we focused our research on light water reactors, and that was simply because that was the largest market. But um, basically, any type of water reactor we have interest for. Thank you. Can I ask you uh, two questions, please? More questions. Uh, my name is uh, Thomas Gardenhaus from uh, the Belgian Nuclear Research Institute. I also want to congratulate you with your excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, your assessment of the fuel central line temperatures in function of burn up, which kind of, which kind of code did you use for the calculations? Well, the, actually, what you saw there, those were actual measure, measured temperatures. Uh, from the instrumented fuel assembly itself. Uh, that wasn't a uh, code-derived temperature. You're, you're talking about this right here? Yeah, because there's also calculated data in red. Oh, yeah. Um, I believe that was uh, FRAPCON originated. FRAPCON code? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And then my second question is, do you have any issues with physical stability of, uh, of thorium-based pellets, in which I mean fragility towards uh, grinding or polishing? Um, no, not major. Of course, you know, thorium dioxide is a, is a harder material. Um, we, we don't use, um, so our, our drilling and our grinding haven't really showed any um, uh, problems, I should say, yet, as far as, uh, you know, the different material properties for the thorium dioxide, despite it being a harder material, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, we, we can take at most one more question. Okay, I do not see any hand. So, uh, Dr. Dora, let me, on behalf of the organizing committee and uh, in appreciation for your efforts to give this excellent talk, uh, give you a little souvenir from this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.